Um, we're entering into the holiday season, so we're going to take a break from going through the book of Acts. And I want us to read a very familiar verse for our Thanksgiving service. As a matter of fact, it's in your Bibles in 1 Thessalonians 5.18. But Adam's going to put it on the screen there. And let's just read it together. Should we, shall we? Let's, let's read. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Let's read it one more time. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Father, for this word. And thank you for this command. This is your will for us. And Father, we want our hearts and our minds and our lives to be shaped as we continue to grow full out for Jesus. Continue to be transformed little by little, step by step from the inside out. We want our lives to do exactly this, Lord. Be people of great thanks and praise and gratitude to you. Father, I know that you transform when that happens. And so, Jesus, help us to grab a hold of the stuff you want us to hear in this verse, in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Turn around and say, things change when we do that. Go ahead, would you please? You know, um... Good to have Pastor Ron and Pastor Betty in service with us this morning. Ron, this has to be the probably number one of the top five verses that pastors share during Thanksgiving service, wouldn't you say? I, I think it is. In fact, I, I would venture to stay, say thou, hundreds of thousands of pastors this morning is teaching on the same verse. Um, but originally... It wasn't given for a cultural Thanksgiving observation. Originally, this verse was given by the Holy Spirit to a group of very precious Christians who didn't celebrate Thanksgiving in their culture. They lived in a place called Thessalonica, and they were experiencing, both the Bible tells us, extreme poverty as well as harsh persecution from their um, community. So harsh that when you read the book of Acts, the account when Paul and the missionary team went there in Thessalonica, they were only there for three weeks and the persecution got so deadly and so bad towards not only Paul and his ministry team, but towards anybody who wants to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Paul and the ministry team were forced out of the community altogether. But why would the Holy Spirit give this command to hurting people? It's because when this command is unlocked by applying the what, the where, and the how that this verse calls for, it brings a transformative miracle to the situation it's acted in. It's just shy of two years ago when I was literally in a place where death, I mean, it hung heavy like a fog. It hung heavy all around me. I felt it in my body when I was lying in intensive care unit at St. Al's downtown Boise. It was registering on the medical equipment. I was going from bad to worse. I saw it on the faces of of the medical personnel, they would come in and, and you could see concern and stern and this kind of professional wall, but you could see it. But even more, I heard it in the mournful cries in the ICU rooms around me 
from families who had just lost loved ones who died of the same disease that I had. I contracted that H1N1 virus and it filled my lungs and it filled their lungs and we were dying. But when I began to apply the what, the where, and the how of this verse, brothers and sisters, the atmosphere of death literally transformed to be one of Christ's light, of his life, of his joy, not only touching me, but it moved through the whole hospital, beginning in that ICU room, and it just started going out more and more and more. See, I believe that you will see miraculous transformation in whatever situation you're in Amen. by simply applying these same truths. So let's unpack. Let's kind of open up the hood of this verse. Get our hands a little greasy. And let's, let's, just, let's just look at the what, the where, and the how of this verse and see how it means and what it means and how it makes true transformation in our situation. Are you up with me? Yeah. Are, are you riding with me on this one? Okay. So you're, the same verse, but when you see the words in capitals, I want you to emphasize it and how you, how you read it. Okay, ready? Let's do it again. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This tells us the what that God wants from us, right? Now notice this verse doesn't say utter thanks or say thanks but rather what does it tell us to do? Give. Give thanks. Giving thanks means you're not just speaking words but you're actually giving something, something from your heart. Amen? I, I, was, I, I decided to read uh, the Old Testament thank offerings and, and what was prescribed by, to the priests when they did. They called them fellowship slash thank offerings. And so I thought, I just, that's interesting. I wanted to read it. And it was a really, it's really kind of was fascinating what they had to, what they had to offer. When they, when they were in fellowship with God, they had peace with God and they were grateful to God. They would bring in an animal that they were to sacrifice. They would come into the temple grounds. They, not the priests, they would place their hands on the animal's head and then they would slay it right then and there. And there it would be skinned. The priest would cook the meat, and uh, actually you took the meat, and you also offered these little these bread to the Lord too, but you took the meat home and you ate it. In fact, you had to eat all of it. And if any was left over for the next day, you had to burn it, which is interesting. They must have knew my family, because Thanksgiving feast, there's usually never thing leftovers there. <laughs> But there was something that stood out and, I, and, and in my thinking process. You've you got to know how I think. When they offered the meat to be cooked, basically, on the altar of God, God said he once reserved for himself the fat of that little lamb and he once the kidneys, and the liver. And they're dedicated to God. And so how my mind thinks when I was reading that, and he kept saying, if you offer this animal, kidney and liver. If you offer this animal, kidney and liver. If you offer this animal, kidney and liver. Which, number one, would not be a problem for me because I don't eat those things. But, but number two, number two, I, I, I thought, you want liver and no onions, you know? <laughs> What, 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 why, why that? Now we know that the, the Old Testament um, sacrificial system was given, it's only temporary. 
It was given to point to Jesus and point to something about God and point to something about his life. Amen? Amen. And we know Jesus fulfilled it all. You know, we know, we know that. But I was asking God, why did you want the kidneys and the liver and the fat? And the way, the way the Lord spoke to me, I'm not going to pastoralize it, make it all nice. This is how God talks in my heart. He says, Tim, because I want what's in your guts. I want what's inside of you. Amen. When you give thanks. Yes. Ever been on the receiving end of empty, heartless, mindless things? I think we all have. Thanks. Oh, okay. And by the way, guys, if your wife says thanks a lot, don't say you're welcome. She doesn't mean it. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just telling you right now. Just don't say you're welcome. Okay? No. But you know, when someone, sometimes people say thanks, it might even be the polite thing or just thanks or whatever. It, it doesn't bless you. An empty, heartless thanks that we get. Oh, God, I got to say thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you again for this food. In Jesus' name, amen. It's not a blessing to the Lord. It doesn't. He wants something of the insight. He wants something of our heart. As a matter of fact, it tells us in Colossians 3.16 that, that all of our expressions of praise, including thanksgiving, is to be offered with great gratitude Amen. of our hearts. Gratitude is what turns our thanks into gold to God. It really does. And our hearts, you, you, you know that your hearts are like a big warehouse. And you store up in your hearts whatever is going on. Sometimes we store negative stuff up and that's what comes out of our mouth, right? And sometimes if we store up good stuff, that's what comes out of our mouth. Well, well, how in the world do we store up gratitude in our hearts? Especially if we're not going through great seasons during, of our life, right? Well, first of all, we start focusing on the good things that God is, the good things that God does, and the good things that God gives no matter what situation we're in. Because let me ask you, is there ever a situation that you've ever, ever, ever been in where God wasn't good? Is there ever a situation, ever, 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 where, where God wasn't doing something for you? Was there ever a situation, ever, 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 where there wasn't God's blessings and gifts? Oh, it might not be what you wanted, but I mean, there were still God ever, ever in your situation? No. And when we start focusing on that, what happens is the negative stuff and the yucky stuff and the angry stuff, we start pushing it out of the warehouse and start filling up our hearts again with gratitude. See, this creates an atmosphere of faith for God to move in and begin to transform. Let me, let me tell you what I mean. I was listening to uh, a, a fellow pastor. He, he's out of California. And he was just talking about, just the other week, he was just talking about, he had this Christian lady who was a part of his church. She was married to this unsaved guy. And her marriage, this guy was miserable, man. Her marriage was miserable. The guy was always angry. The guy was always yelling at something. The guy was never happy about anything. The guy complained about everything. The guy was just self-centered and selfish and just all this stuff. He was wrapped up in his own stuff stuff all the time and she tried to live and she tried to serve and she tried to love day in day out and, and it didn't take too many years before she said I can't do this anymore I think we all, all relate to that so she went to her pastor and said I, I, I got in this marriage man this for lack of a better word my husband is toxic He said, well, I tell you what, 
before we go there, before we talk about ending the marriage, I want to ask you to do two things for me and for the Lord. Just two things. And then after a month or two, then talk to me. But for one month, would you do two things? She says, well, what, Pastor? He said, the first thing I want you to do is I don't want you to say anything negative to your husband. I don't want you to return his complaints with complaints. I don't want you to return his bickering with bickering. I don't want you to be ugly back to his ugliness. I, I don't want you to complain about him, not only to your husband, but to your friends. I don't want you to complain about your marriage to your friends, ever. Don't let them hear another word about it for a whole month. She goes, okay. And he says, then there's the second thing I want you to do. Ask God to open your eyes to start seeing what's good about your husband and what's good about your marriage and restore gratitude. She said, well, <laughs> I don't think there's going to be anything he's going to show me, but I'll do it. A whole month went on. Something happened. God started opening her eyes to the good things that God is and that God has given her. God started showing her integrity in her husband and good qualities in her husband and why she fell in love with them in the first place. And God started, he wasn't saved. But God was showing her just the fact that he had been faithful and the fact that he was always there. And, and, and even though, but she, you know, he was never abusive. He wasn't this big old drunk. But, but God started showing her these things. And she, she, her gratitude, the warehouse of her heart started filling with gratitude. She started saying, thank you, God, for my husband. She hadn't thanked God for her husband in I don't know how long. Thank you, God, for my marriage. She hadn't been thanking God for her marriage in I don't know how long. But that gratitude overflowed, and she started saying thank you to her husband for who he is, really. And thank you for the marriage, what it is, really. And it was not fake. It was not thanks a lot. It was, I so appreciate this. That woman became transformed. But not only that, her witness of gratitude towards her husband led him to Jesus and he got saved. Jesus came in him and transformation began to happen. He's changed. She already changed. He changed. Guess what? was a new marriage. All because she allowed God to fill her heart with gratitude and give thanks in all situations. That's the what God wants us to do. Let's read this verse again, emphasize the capitals. Here's the where God wants us to do it at. Read it with me. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Here we have the where. This is the where God wants us. Where does God want us to do this at? Is there ever a time in your life that you weren't in a circumstance? <laughs> forever. The Bible says in Psalms, it says we'll thank him forever. You know why? Heaven is a circumstance. A great circumstance. We're, we're to give thanks all the time, no matter where we are at. Amen? Amen? However, when facing circumstances that don't offer a whole lot of things to be thankful for, this can be tough to do. And, and here's where the Christian usually finds himself a little pulled. Because we don't want to be a big phony and we don't want to lie. And we don't want to just give God lip service. Am I right or wrong? Yeah. And, and, and God doesn't want us to die. Listen, if there's just very little in the cupboards to feed the children with, it's not 
lack of faith to say, there's very little in the cupboards to feed the children with. Real faith always begins with truth. Amen. 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 There's nothing wrong with that. However, however, even in the worst of circumstances, God is there. His heart is for you. And his hand is not too short to work all things together for the good of those who love the Lord and who are called according to his purposes. Amen? Amen. And when we learn to be grateful and give thanks, even for the most meager things, in the most meager of circumstances, transformation begins to happen. Uh, you know, this, you, you know the event in Jesus' life. Perfect illustration of this. Jesus was teaching in a remote place by the Sea of Galilee. And there were thousands who were there. The Bible says there were at least 5,000 men, not counting wives and children. A very conservative estimate. There was 12 thousand people there. Well, what turned into should have been a morning afternoon session because Jesus kept teaching and teaching. People also wanted to be healed. Well, you try to have a healing service with 12,000 people, it's going to take some time. And so they probably all came out to follow and find Jesus. They probably brought their lunches with them and had already eaten it. But now the teaching and the healing had just gone on and on and on and on. And now it is getting late. Sun is going down. They needed to be dismissed. They need to find their way back home. But no one had any food. And Jesus was concerned because if all these people were to make their way back, Back and hike back to their homes or, or villages and stuff. He was worried that they'll just be so hungry they'll faint. They'll, it will hurt them. And so Jesus says to the disciples, uh, fine, we, we need to feed these guys. I love John's depiction of it because then some of the disciples says, do you know how much it's going to cost to feed 12,000 people dinner? <laughs> I understand that concern. Jesus said, what do you have? Well, there was a little boy there. And this little boy, like kids do. Uh, do you have kids who go 100 miles an hour and they don't eat? Yeah. And so like kids do, there, there was a little boy there and, and he had his lunch left over. And the Bible says he had five loaves and two fishes. Now when you think of loaves, I don't want you to think of Big Albertson's huge loaves, okay? This is what I want you to think, according to the Greek. He had five biscuits and two sardines. It was probably in his little lunch pail that had David and Goliath on it, you know, and, and stuff. But, but there, there he was. And that's all, that's all the food there was among the 12,000 people. And the most amazing thing happened when they gave it to Jesus. The Je Bible says Jesus held the five biscuits and the two sardines. And Jesus did not ask God for a miracle. He didn't. Read it. It's in your Bible. It's in all the Gospels. Read it. He didn't ask God for a miracle. He didn't even say, God, we're in trouble. You know what he did? He gratefully, sincerely thanked God for what was there. He was grateful for that and he had he had men set in a hundred groups of 50 and after he had given thanks he started breaking these biscuits you know if God is going to do this big miracle he didn't need five biscuits he only needed one so I wonder if he broke the biscuits Broken in half, broken in half, broken in half, broken in half, the fifth one, broken in half, but it's still whole, broken in half, but it's still whole. I wonder if that's how it worked. Uh, I'm going to check out that DVD in heaven. I'm telling you what. <laughs> but the point is, he was just 
thankful for the meager, little stuff he had. But he was thankful. And the Bible says they all ate and were satisfied. And not only that, so you go, well, was the miracle that they got just a crumb and God just filled their tummy? Oh, no, no, no. To make sure you don't think that's what happened. The Bible says there were 12 basketfuls of pieces of bread and fish left over after everyone ate. More than once in my life, I didn't have enough. That's how some of us feel about our checkbook at the end of every month. And we do this. I know I'm supposed to be thankful, so I guess I thank you, Lord. I mean, that's really what's coming out of our hearts. Instead of saying, you know what, God? Even with my five biscuits and two fish, I didn't deserve it. This is so wonderful for you to provide this for me. This is so good that you know us and you love us. And Father, I just thank you. Thank you. Maybe some of you around your holiday Thanksgiving, you're going to have turkey hot dogs, and that's all you could afford. Are you going to be grateful or not? God will transform and do a miracle when all circumstances Amen. we give thanks. Amen? All right. So we know the what we're to do, give thanks. We know the where we're to do it in all circumstances. The why is because it's God's will for us. But how about the how? Read this verse one more time and emphasize one more time the words in capitals. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. That's the how. See, everything that's ever done right in the Christian life is, is by Christ doing it through us. Right? Seriously. We don't come up with it and say, aren't you glad I'm your son, God? You know, we don't do that. We just say, God, Jesus, this is you. See, ours is a shared faith. By faith, we share our life with Jesus. And through faith, he shares his heart with our hearts. He shares his mind in our thoughts. He shares his strength in our bodies. It's all about Jesus. God never intended us for us to give thanks independently of being fully in Christ Jesus. It needs to be, you know, Lord, because the Bible says Jesus is the one when it's filtered through him, when it's done with him. He's the one that makes it heaven worthy. Amen. Amen. So I was there laying in my ICU room and I was helpless. I was in such enormous pain. And because of the, the chemistry changes that had gone on in my body, I was weaker than I had ever been before. I could not hardly even move. I had to relearn how to walk. There's all sorts of tubes and gadgets coming out of me. And when I cried out to the Father, this verse is what came to me. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And, and I was saying to God, I said, you know, God, I can hardly string two lucid thoughts together. How can I do this? I can't hardly talk. How can I do this? And all of a sudden in my heart, it just was clear as a bell. In Christ Jesus. 
See, I knew that Jesus was in me through his Holy Spirit. And I knew that Jesus was not restricted by my physical limitations. So I said something like this. I want to do what God wants me to do. But Jesus, it's got to be you through me. And I started sensing gratitude well up. And those dumb machines, beep, 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 beep. <laughs> you know, all those different machines that I was on, I was looking at them, I was going, these are amazing, you're using them, these are tools, Father, thank you for those machines. And, and, and the nurses that was coming up, thank you, God, they are your tools, you, you are blessing them through me, you're blessed, God, they're yours. The doctors, oh, Father, God, thank you, thank you, thank you that I'm here. Thank you, I'm being so well taken care of. Even the janitor, when you finally fall asleep, you know it's four in the morning, you finally get to sleep, and they're with their bucket so they can, you know, you're waking up. Ah, thank you for them. They're keeping it clean in here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, as, as Jesus started giving me words, as Jesus started giving me gratitude, as Jesus started showing me what to thank God for, as I started thanking God, I started thanking them too. And as I began to thank them, joy started filling the room. And it wasn't just in me. Healing filled me. Amen. But there was his presence, his life that was filling me. And I'm not kidding you, Chris. She was there. She could witness. I was thanking God because Chris was always there. She could testify to this thing. It was like light rushed out of my ICU room and started penetrating in the other rooms and in the hospital and, and all the hospital and these nurses and these workers and the janitors and the doctors. Oh, you know, they, they, they see so much death in those situations, and so they're, they're kind of professional, and they're not personal. They have to be. They have to guard their hearts. I understand. I get that. But the gratitude melted away their wall. And they started coming in and talking. And so, finally, I just got, got a little healing here, a little healing there. They pulled that thing out of my neck. Glory to God, you know. They were doing this. They were doing that. And it was getting better and better. And finally, they moved me from ICU to a place called telemetry. And telemetry just basically means you're still hooked up and somebody's, moder um, somebody's monitoring, mo monitoring you. It's basically what was going on. What was weird? No one knew I was this big pastor. They just knew I was a big sicko. <laughs> but Chris can tell you, you know, usually big city hospitals will have certain rooms, certain places that are reserved for top executives and for very important VIPs. They put me in a VIP room. I was grateful. It was like the coolest thing. In fact, people kept coming in and looking at me like, whoa, this is the VIP room, man. What, what did you? I'm just so thankful for you. I just, thank you. You're, you come and you, you change my bed and you, and you just help me and you're just so kind. And now this is, this is what was really crazy. I started seeing the life of Christ working and the joy and the touch of Christ working. And brothers and sisters, I kid you not, my wife is here. She's my witness. I see you nurses got off shift from downstairs, went upstairs to sit with me and talk to me and tell me their problems and have me pray with them. Ah, not just ICU nurses. Workers, and get this, the doctors that were down there would get off shift and come up. And I'm just, I'm just off, but I, I just, I just want to come up, and I just want to be with you, and I just want to. Why? It wasn't because of my radiant personality. It had nothing to do with that. It had everything to do with by giving thanks and being grateful and and loving and 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 just doing that. Not only God, but those people around me. They. 
sensed Jesus and were attracted. Doctors would come and ask me to pray for them. In fact, it didn't just happen there. It happened then when they moved to extended care. Told me in the extended care hospital, it transformed it. Didn't tell anyone I was a pastor. Didn't want them to know. I didn't know if I was ever going to be a pastor again because of how sick I was. But God, it was four weeks ago or a little, maybe two months ago, my wife and I, I was taking my wife to a appointment. And this ICU nurse changed her jobs. And when she saw Chris and I, she remembered us. And she came out and hugged us. You are them. You are them. Seriously. Thank you so much. My pulmonologist is my buddy. We talk Jesus and I witness to her to this day. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let Jesus do it in you and through you and watch transformations happen. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, let's bow our hearts, shall we? Life happens to all of us, and it messes the warehouse up of our heart. We'll go through a hard time, we'll go through a hardship, we'll go through some ugly stuff. And without, without looking out, what will happen is... Our hearts become crowded with worry, with anger. Our hearts will be crowded with bewilderment, fear. Our hearts will be crowded with doubt. Our hearts will be crowded with complaints, negativity. And it surprises us because it just all doesn't all sweep in. But one little box of negativity drives out a box of gratitude. One little box of complaint or anger drives out another box of praise and thanksgiving. One, and, and, and it's just so slow. Maybe this morning you're sensing right now that, you know, Lord, I want to be grateful in my heart. But quite frankly, I'm really low on gratitude right now. Just confess that to the Lord right now. I need to do that. Would you change me? Would you, like that lady, open my eyes to you? Can I bring all my negativity and my anger and my griping and my fear, can I leave it at your cross, Jesus, and let you deal with it and let go of it? Would you help me do that right now? Would you fill my heart this week with great gratitude? Because I want to see you transform things, Lord. Would you do that? Jesus says, of course he will. His heart for us is to grow more and more like him. Become full-out followers of Jesus. Of course he will. Now, there might be someone in this place this morning that you don't even know Jesus as your Savior, and, and you've heard that God loves you, and you've heard that God loves you so much He gave you a son in Jesus, and Jesus took the penalty for your sins on the cross, so you don't have to go to hell with them. And you know in and of yourself there's nothing good you could do, there's nothing you could achieve or give to God that will change your spiritual condition. God has to do it for you. And he's done it in giving you Jesus. Would you like to receive Jesus right now? Jesus gives us both repentance, this is grace, and eternal life. 
if that's you, I want you just to pray this prayer right now. And if you're watching across the world on YouTube, you can pray the same prayer. God, your prayer is not going to save you. Jesus is going to save you. And the fact that you desire this right now means God is already working in you with his grace. God is ready to save you in Jesus Christ. Just pray this prayer. Just pray this prayer. Say, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. And from this day forward, I want to receive your gift of love to me, Jesus Christ, as my Savior and as my Lord. Say, dear God, with your help, I now turn from my life of sin to following Jesus. And from this moment on, I put my trust in in Him as my living Savior. Do you know if you prayed that, it's because God's grace helped you do that? It's because God loved you and He wants you right now? And did you know as soon as you prayed that, did you know the Holy Spirit right now is in you? And did you know that all your sins are totally erased? And did you know the Son of God, the Spirit of His Son, is now transforming your heart little by little, step by step from this day forward. I want to encourage those of you who've prayed this prayer for the first time, read the Gospel of John and talk to us. If you're at a place around the world that you're not close to a Bible-believing church or fellowship, it might be dangerous for you, but either online or through however, find a Bible in your language and read the Gospel of John. If you prayed that prayer this morning and you meant it in your heart, just raise your hand so I know who I'm praying for. Doesn't mean that's now you're going to get saved because you raise your hands, just because you're already saved. The Lord's already done a work in you. Anybody here this morning? Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Jesus, for this word. We're not done yet. Can I have you stand? Do something very uncomfortable for some of you. Now I want you to pray blessing on that neighbor of yours. They might have a physical need. They might have a financial need. You don't know. There might be a circumstance that's very meager. Would you just ask God to intervene now in the name of Jesus and to open their eyes to the goodness of God for them? Go ahead. Pray for one another right now, would you? Go ahead. Let's just pray. Jesus, we pray for each other right now in this building. We love you and we bless you. Thank you. Lord, I believe people are going to see some transformation in their situation. Hallelujah. I believe you're going to move, you're going to touch, you're going to heal. I believe, Lord, that it's just going to be an amazing time in you, Jesus. Continue. Continue to bless, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, Teresa, if you can come. And hey, let's uh, sing. We can't leave without singing this last song during for our Thanksgiving season.